Lookout posts from the Second World War were not designed as recording studios. They're basically concrete boxes. While this might be stating the obvious and a bizarre way to start a podcast, it does go some way to explain the acoustics in the introduction. Don't worry, most of the show is recorded here in my home and not in that concrete box. So it's only a couple of minutes at the beginning that really does help set the scene for the show. Recording the Irish History Podcast has taken me to lots of unusual places, but I don't think there's many that rival my office for today. So I'm recording this in a Second World War lookout post perched on a cliff top overlooking the Celtic Sea off the south coast of Ireland. Now the views are stunning, but this isn't exactly what I had planned for today. I'm sure the history of this lookout post is fascinating, but I haven't come here to talk about this or the Second World War. This is just somewhere I can kind of get a bit of shelter from the howling wind outside. So a few hundred metres away from where I'm standing now lie the remains of a shipwreck, and that's the focus of today's show. However, the wind is making recording over at the shipwreck site an absolute non-starter. And this lookout post which does give me some protection from the wind, is not an ideal recording studio either. So I am going to record most of this show back at home. But before I leave, I do want to describe a bit of my surroundings because they're integral to the story of this remarkable shipwreck. So earlier this morning, I drove west from Waterford for an hour to the village of Ardmore. Now that's a picturesque little village with a really long history. It's most famous for its early medieval monastery that overlooks the village. It's actually one of the oldest in Ireland. It may well even have had a Christian community here before St. Patrick. However, I want to talk about something much more recent. I didn't actually spend that much time in Ardmore this morning. Instead, I followed a coastal path that trails out of the town to the southwest and leads up to this lookout post where I'm recording now. If you're like me and dislike heights, that path is a bit daunting at times. To the right, there are lovely open fields, but to the left, the cliff edge plunges down what must be, I'd say, 50 metres to the sea. You might even be able to hear the sea in the distance from here. Now, on days like today, this place is a postcard image of rugged natural beauty. But the show is actually about something that's a bit of an eyesore in these stunning surroundings. So, not far from where I am standing right now is an enormous, rusting ship. When you see it first, you actually need a second to take it in because it's so out of place in such pristine surroundings. But the story of how this shipwreck came to be stranded here is extraordinary. What remains at the cliffs below me here is, or what was a vessel called the Samson. Now, when you think of shipwrecks, you might conjure up the image of a rotting wooden hull But the Samson couldn't be more different. It's a giant rusting frame of iron and steel. It almost looks like some weird metallic sea monster climbing out of the ocean. The Samson was actually once a floating crane, but this is not like your average crane because it towered 50 meters above the sea. Today, when you stumble on it, the Samson is a complete eyesore, as I say, in what is a pretty pristine landscape. But this rusting hulk has inserted itself in the history of Ardmore, becoming the latest chapter in a story that stretches back a thousand years. This is partly because the story of the wreck is so unique and unusual. One of the defining things about the story of the Samson is that it was a wreck that people refused to leave, even though it was breaking up around them. Now, I had planned to tell the entire story of the Samson out here on the cliffs, but the wind in the background, as I'm sure you can hear, has scuppered those plans. So I am going to head home and record the rest of the show there. This might throw things a little out of shape, but that's all on me. Planning to record outdoors on a cliff edge in the middle of winter in Ireland wasn't my greatest idea, but I'll pick up the story when I get back home. Okay, I'm back at home and we can continue the story now. But before we do, let's get the formalities done and dusted. My name is Finn Dewar. This is the Irish History Podcast. And if you're tuning in for the first time, make sure you're subscribed to the show if you haven't done already. 
I also want to say a massive thank you to all the listeners who've got behind my plans for 2024 so far. A few weeks ago, I explained my ambitious plan to make a series on the 1798 Rebellion later in the year. Now, to do this properly, I estimate I need about 200 new supporters. We're closing in on that target, and when we're not quite there, I'm increasingly confident we're going to make it. You can help make my plans possible by joining listeners who have become supporters on Patreon by clicking on the link to patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast in the show notes below. Finally, you might already be wondering what the Samson, the shipwreck I'm going to be talking about today, looks like. I have pictures and videos uploaded to my new WhatsApp and Telegram channels linked below. There's lots there. I've got that World War II lookout post I was recording in earlier. I have videos and, as I say, pictures of the Samson there. Check them out in the links below. Sound on today's show was by Kate Dunley. When it comes to the story of the Samson, or indeed any shipwreck, there are three key factors that shape the story. So, there is going to be three distinct aspects to this episode. There's obviously the ship itself, in this case the Samson. Then there's the natural and environmental factors, waves, storms, cliffs, rocks, icebergs, whatever causes the ship to be wrecked. Then finally, there are the people affected by it. And in the case of the Samson, the people who shape the story. So we'll begin with the ship itself. Then we'll look at the natural and environmental factors. And this will set the stage for the entry of the people, or the person really, who defines this story. So the Samson, or what's left of it today, was a pretty unusual ship. While it's slowly being broken up by the seas on an idyllic coastline at Ardmore, it spent most of its working life in very different surroundings. It was, for over two decades, an integral part of the industrial skyline of the port of Liverpool. As I mentioned when I was in Ardmore, it was an enormous crane on a floating platform. It stood 50 metres above the waterline, with a jib or arm that was over 25 metres long. And the Samson, along with a sister crane, an even larger one called the Mammoth, worked for decades loading and unloading ships in the port of Liverpool. These were instantly recognisable landmarks on the Liverpool skyline through the 60s, the 70s and the 80s. And this made them part of Liverpool's identity. Indeed, in what was a very different time when that city was shaped by a pride in its industrial heritage, these two cranes embodied it. They were even paraded before Queen Elizabeth when she visited the city in 1977. Now, the Samson's working life and the story of how it came to be wrecked off the coast of Waterford began in the mid-1980s when the port authorities in Liverpool decided it, along with its sister crane, the Mammoth, needed to be replaced. While works began on an even larger crane that would replace them, in Liverpool decisions had to be made about what would happen to the Samson and the Mammoth. The latter had been built before the First World War, so it was sold for scrap but the Samson was only 27 years old at this point and was deemed still fit for use. In 1987 then, a deal that saw it, along with a tugboat that used to haul it around the Liverpool docks, was finalised and the two of them were sold to a shipping firm, the Zamet Brothers, based on the island of Malta. Now to get the crane to Malta was something of an epic voyage. The Samson had only once left the port of Liverpool during its working life when it was used on a construction project in Wales but now it would have to sail down the length of the Irish Sea, then into the Atlantic Ocean, around the coasts of France and Spain. Then, after passing through the Straits of Gibraltar, it would sail half the way across the Mediterranean Sea to the island of Malta, just off the coast of Sicily. This was an 18-day voyage that would cover 3,000 miles. Now, in order to get the Samson there, it was decided the crane itself was up to the voyage. So rather than dissemble it, the tug that normally hauled it around the Liverpool docks was entrusted to carry it all the way to Malta. When the crane and the tugboat set off on this voyage on December the 9th, 1987, it was a bit of a bizarre sight with a small, squat tugboat pulling this enormous crane behind it. I don't think it's a plot spoiler to tell you at this point, it never reached the island of Malta. But how it came to be wrecked off the coast of Waterford is an interesting story in itself. The task of bringing the Samson on what was a 3,000 mile journey was entrusted to a crew of seven men. 
but their ordeal on board would become the stuff of nightmares. Of the seven, five remained on the tugboat, while two took up stations on the Samson itself to ensure everything remained in working order. I'm guessing the plan was that they would rotate these two off the Samson because the crane didn't really have any living quarters. There was a bridge where it was steered from and then higher up there was a small cabin where the crane driver would normally sit but there was no space for creature comforts. Now when the Samson left the port of Liverpool, the two who remained on the crane itself were a deckhand called Nigel Smith and a Maltese engineer, Raymond Barlotto. Now these guys were by no means veterans of the sea. Smith was 28, while Barlotto was only 23. Now the opening hours of the voyage went off without a hitch. However, the Samson didn't get very far before it ran into very heavy weather. By the morning of the 10th of December, the tug and the crane had reached the Smalls Lighthouse off the coast of Wales. That's more or less parallel with the south coast of Ireland, but on the other side of the Irish Sea. I'll make a map and I'll put it on the WhatsApp and Telegram channels actually of all this. You'll find that in the show notes below. But it was when it reached the Smalls Lighthouse, a few miles off the coast of Wales, that disaster struck. At 7.30am, this was still before sunrise, it was December after all, in the middle of extremely stormy weather. The ropes connecting the Samson to the tugboat snapped. Now this left the huge crane adrift in the Irish Sea. It did have its own propellers, but these weren't powerful enough to move the crane. It could only direct it into position. However, on that morning, December the 10th, the winds were blowing from the east, which I'm guessing initially some people at least saw as a positive. It avoided an immediate crisis. Had the winds been blowing from the west, they would have pushed the Samson onto the coast of Wales within an hour or so. This left the monster crane, however, to drift out into the Irish Sea with Barlotto and Smith on board. The tugboat followed at a distance but was largely powerless to intervene until the storm passed and the seas calmed a bit when they could then try to reattach the cable. However, on that morning, there was no sign of any respite in the weather. Indeed, over the following hours, Barlotto and Smith on board the Samson found themselves in a terrifying situation. As the stormy conditions continued, waves crashed over the Samson, pushing the huge crane west towards Ireland at a rapid pace. Now, if this continued, the crane would eventually crash into the Irish coast. However, fears grew that it might never make it that far. The Samson was top heavy. It stretched 50 metres into the sky above the waterline. This naturally created a risk that it would capsize in the heavy seas and sink, bringing the two crew hands, Barlotto and Smith, with it. Now, for nearly 20 hours, the pair repeatedly tried to turn the crane into a safer, more favourable position, but its small propellers were not up to the task. Night fell on December the 10th and there was still no let up in the weather. The crane was totally out of control and it had now crossed the Irish Sea and wasn't far from the Irish coast. There was a force aid gale blowing as well, meaning the tug still could not get close enough to reattach the cable and pull it to safety. Eventually, it was decided that the two crewmen would have to be lifted off the Samson. The English Coast Guard at Plymouth had been monitoring the situation through the night and they decided to act in the early hours of December the 12th. A Royal Air Force Sea King helicopter was dispatched and in dramatic scenes, the two crew members, Smith and Barlotto, were winched to safety at 3am in the morning. They were then taken to Cork City, further down the Irish coast, where they received treatment. Meanwhile, the Samson was left to drift. Although the word drift doesn't really convey the situation. With gales of up to 30 knots an hour continuing to blow, the Samson was not only out of control, but it was veering directly for the Irish coast. Now for those monitoring the situation, it became increasingly clear that Ram Head near Ardmore was the likely point of impact. This juts out into the Celtic Sea, almost like a hook for passing ships. And as the morning approached on December the 12th, it became clear this was where the Samson would hit the coast. Meanwhile, however, on land in Ardmore, as the crane began to drift perilously close to the cliffs near the village, the reaction among some was not what you might expect. While the Royal Air Force had dispatched a helicopter to pluck the two crew members to safety, a local man spotted opportunity in this situation. Arming himself with nothing but a rope, he headed out into the stormy weather 
planning to board the stricken crane and claim it as his own. Now all this sounds a bit bizarre. I'm going to explain that in the third part of the show because this man would shape the story of the Samson more than anyone else. By 7am on the morning of December the 12th, the Samson had drifted perilously close to the Irish coastline. The tugboat, which had followed the massive crane across the Irish Sea, could only watch on as the inevitable happened at 7.48 in the morning when the Samson crashed into the cliffs at Ram Head and became entangled on the rocks under the water. Immediately, local officials were extremely alarmed. Ardmore is located on the borders between counties Waterford and Cork, so county council officials in both jurisdictions became involved. In Cork, where the crew had been taken by the RAF helicopter, the county engineer, Lee Mullins, was informed that there was 100 tonnes of diesel still on the crane. No one was certain about the extent of the damage the crane had sustained when it crashed into the cliffs, so it was very possible it would start to break up and this diesel would then leak into the seas around Ardmore. Meanwhile, in Malta, when the new owners of the Samson, the Zamet brothers, heard what was happening, they immediately bought plane tickets and headed to Ireland to see the situation for themselves. Dramatic as all these events were, they were about to take on an unforeseen twist when a new dynamic entered the situation in the form of local Ardmore man, Jimmy Rooney. Now, Jimmy Rooney was something of a local celebrity in Ardmore. Aged 43 in 1987, he had been a prominent member of the Ardmore Gaelic football team that won the county final back in 1965. Now, if you're listening to this and you're thinking that's a weirdly specific thing to bring up, believe me, there's one way to gain immortality in a local community in Ireland, and that's to win a county final for your club for the first time. Through the 1980s, Rooney had run a local bar called the Old Strand Inn, but he had moved on from this by 1987. In terms of this story, he was a beachcomber. Now, normally that would see him walk the beaches around Ardmore, picking up flotsam and jetsam that washed ashore. But in December 1987, Rooney was planning the haul of a lifetime. He believed if he could board the stricken Samson, he could claim salvage rights over the vessel, meaning basically it would be his. Now, the first step in this, though, was to board the crane to assert his rights. Now, I've stood on those cliffs looking down at the Samson, and there's no way down, or at least no safe way down. However, this didn't deter Jimmy Rooney. Despite the poor weather, at 9am in the morning of December 12th, just over an hour after the Samson had crashed into the cliffs, Rooney went out to Ram Head, threw a rope down the cliff and began to scale down. He then boarded the crane in what the Evening Echo newspaper described as a Tarzan-like feat. Once there, he claimed salvage rights. Naturally, this immediately drew down media coverage and Rooney was very clear. The Samson was effectively his now and he could dispose of it as he wished. In the early days of the saga, the value of the crane was put into tens of thousands and it's worth remembering Ireland was in the depths of a recession at this point. Now, whatever about the legality of his move, it quickly became clear that Rooney might not even survive to tell the tale. By the afternoon of the first day he had boarded the crane, a crowd had gathered on the cliff and Rooney, who had taken up lodgings in the bridge of the crane, emerged to salute them. However, as he did this, he slipped and only barely managed to avoid falling into the stormy waters by his fingertips. Now, while this may have highlighted the dangers of being on board the crane, Jimmy Rooney was adamant he wasn't leaving. Two days later, on the Monday, the Irish examiner was reporting gale force winds and mountainous seas in the waters around the crane. Rooney himself told friends and supporters how he had stood on the bridge of the crane watching these huge waves crash over the rocks around him. As this was playing out, the environmental concerns of the wider maritime community were realised when 70 tonnes of diesel leaked into the sea. In what was a different time, people were relieved when this just dispersed into the wider ocean rather than concentrate around Ardmore, which would have been a disaster for the local economy. However, through the following days, focus shifted back onto Jimmy Rooney's claim of salvage rights. While few could doubt his bravery, there was a near unanimous agreement that he didn't have a legal leg to stand on. The ship owners, the Zamet brothers, had not abandoned the Samson. The crew had only left due to safety concerns. Nevertheless, despite all legal experts denying his rights, 
Jimmy Rooney dug in for the long haul. He began to receive food in a bucket and relayed messages back the same way. He would eventually set up a two-way radio by which he could communicate with the media. Meanwhile, one of the owners, Joe Zamet, arrived in Ireland from Malta and visited the Samson on December the 15th with a Dutch engineer to examine the possibility of salvaging the crane. But Jimmy Rooney insisted he would not leave. He even said if the crane was towed to England, he would go with it. This certainly presented his trump card. Possession, as they say, is nine-tenths of the law, and he would have to be consulted now no matter what would happen to the Samson. While the storm conditions finally abated on Wednesday the 16th of December 1987, Jimmy Rooney got no respite as a spring tide was forecast, meaning the crane could easily be flooded. Then, on Thursday the 17th, a team of seven divers and marine surveyors did manage to investigate the hull of the ship to see if it could be refloated. They discovered major holes. This did not bode well in terms of the crane being moved by anyone, the owners or Jimmy Rooney. However, on board the Samson, Jimmy Rooney was now running a savvy one-man media campaign. He pivoted to attack the Zamets, the crane owners, claiming that they were just going to take insurance and abandon the wreck on the shoreline at Arab Moor. Indeed, over the following weeks, Rooney increasingly presented himself and his cause as that of a man trying to protect his community from environmental damage. By Sunday, December the 18th, as his occupation entered its second week, there was no sign he was going to leave. Indeed, by Christmas Eve, he was on the Samson 12 days and he was settling in to celebrate Christmas dinner on board, complete with turkey that was going to be delivered. I should acknowledge there were rumours circulating that he was in fact leaving the crane each evening. These were referenced in the press, but no journalist ever arrived not to find Rooney on board. Now the closing days of 1987 saw the situation become increasingly dangerous on the Samson as the Irish coast was battered by major storms that year. The winds were so strong that one of the hatches on the Samson was blown clean off. People couldn't even stand at the cliff edge to talk to Jimmy Rooney. While he did survive, he found himself in an increasingly dangerous position with little chance of a resolution. The Zamets, who owned the Samson, were increasingly disengaging from the entire affair and it looked like they were going to do precisely what Jimmy Rooney had been predicting they would, that they would claim insurance and abandon the wreck on the coastline. On January 8, 1988, the company Celtic Divers and Salvage published a distressing report on the condition of the Samson. They deemed it a liability. This meant that the costs of salvaging it exceeded anything anyone could make from it. In this scenario, even if Rooney could get salvage rights, they would be worthless. Perhaps though even more alarming was the threat the wreck now posed to Jimmy Rooney's life. Michael Whelan of Celtic Divers and Salvage said the back of the Samson had been broken and it was holed in 20 places and was at a great risk of disintegrating. While there were growing calls for the Irish government to intervene, they were actually powerless to act unless it posed a risk as a pollutant. But given the diesel was now gone, this was no longer an issue. Under laws of the time, as I understand it, if they removed the Samson, the owners, the Zamet brothers, could potentially sue the government. By the 21st of January 1988, Jimmy Rooney faced his 40th day on board, what he described as a living hell. Over the previous six weeks, the Samson had been relentlessly battered by waves and was starting to break up around him. In an interview around this time, his resolve showed the first signs of breaking when he told a journalist from the Cork Examiner he couldn't stay forever. This perhaps was shaped by a terrifying experience on January the 19th. As I mentioned earlier, during his time on the Samson, he had been living in the bridge but on that day, he was suddenly awoken at 6am to a loud bang and then water began pouring in. He looked out and saw that the stormy conditions had ripped away the front of the crane. It didn't sink because it was lodged on a rock. Rooney then retreated up into the small box where the crane driver would once have sat, which was above the waterline, but an end was clearly coming, whether he liked it or not. Finally, on January the 22nd, 1988, after 40 days, Jimmy Rooney left the Samson. He claimed he had made an agreement with an Irish salvage company who claimed they could tow the crane, but this seems to have been more face-saving than any real promise. In any case, the receiver of wrecks in Cove threatened Rooney if he tried to remove the Samson, he would be committing a crime. 
It seems that they were determined to stop any legal precedent being set, which might open up other similar cases where people could board ships and claim salvage rights. However, this ensured the Samson was left to rust, and 36 years later, it's still there. Indeed, when Jimmy Rooney left the crane, the last hope that the wreck might be removed dissipated as attention and focus on it began to fade. It was raised by politicians in the Doyle on two occasions, but it seems the government could not act for legal reasons which I've mentioned earlier. Through 1988, the Samson began to rust rapidly. It turned into a complete eyesore. However, over time, attitudes to the wreck in Ardmore have changed. The strange, even unsightly nature of the crane have made it an attraction in itself. Indeed, the propeller has since been mounted in Ardmore. You can see pictures of this. I've posted them to my WhatsApp and Telegram channels. However, in the 2020s, it does seem that the Samson is in the very final chapters of its life. The jib, or the arm of the crane, which was outstretched when it crashed into Ram Head, has since collapsed into the seas below. I found it hard to get a precise date for when this occurred. The Wikipedia entry for the Samson claims it was in 2016. Now today, when you visit the site and compare it to pictures taken, say, in 1987 or even 1997, you really get an appreciation for how fast it's disintegrating. Whether it'll be there in 2037 is very doubtful. Okay, so that's where I'm going to leave today's episode. Next week, I'll be back with an episode on Irish Mormonism, if I can finish the research on that. I have a fascinating story of an exile from the Great Hunger who became a polygamist in Utah, but getting it right is very tricky. In the meantime, do check out my WhatsApp and Telegram channels. You'll find lots of pictures of the Samson there. I have links to both of those in the show notes below. And finally, I also have links to Patreon there too. You can find more about the perks of being a supporter and my plans for the upcoming year there. So, until next time, Sloan. Thank you.